As usual, click record before I forget, and then let's take attendance. So please tell me that you exist. And we'll go from there. And get some water too. All right. So, uh, also, I better remember to give out your next essay at the end of the lecture today. So I'll try my best to not forget that. Because you have one to do this. All right, so we were on these artificial intelligence slides. Let's keep on going with those. Let's keep on trucking. And so we ended down here talking about cool stuff, computers, learning on their own, teaching themselves to play fancy games better than any human can. Let's, let's go a step further, right? There are some problems that are easy for humans, relatively, but are hard for computers. Let's talk about that. So self-driving cars, that's a big thing, right? What is that? How do you teach a computer to drive a car? Well, really, it's just blink detection all over again, isn't it? It's okay, I'm getting information from my sensors, and I better draw some boxes around things that I notice. I better notice that, uh, let's zoom in here. I better figure out where the road is. This is kind of what a uh, self-driving car might think of when it sees the street in front of it. It needs to notice, okay, here's the side that I can drive on. That's important, right? It needs to notice, uh, okay, I can't drive over here, that means... These are the two yellow lines that are blocking me from going that way. Uh, what else? What else? It needs to figure out where all the cars are. Like, I better avoid those in case they swerve into my lane. They're not supposed to be anywhere near me because those cars are going the other way. But that's okay. Maybe it notices this car down there. Like, I can't speed up too fast. I don't want to hit it. Um, you need to notice pedestrians, right? Humans walking, not just cars. So you need more than just, like, a metal detector on your sonar. You need to notice the lights, all the traffic lights. Sorry, that my, maybe I can use a different color. That's more visible. You need to figure out where those are because those are telling you what you can and can't do right now. Yeah. So it's a lot of boxes that need to be drawn to figure out what to do. And of course you have like GPS inside of you as well, but maybe that uh, something goes wrong with it and you can't trust it all the time. There's a lot of factors involved, but at the end of the day, it's kind of blink detection where you're drawing boxes around things, you're noticing what's there, and you're interpreting the scene. That's what humans do with their eyes, right? So, yeah, you need to figure out all of this stuff, where everything is, and then once you know where everything is, you need to interpret that stuff. So, uh, based on what I just noticed, the pedestrian's here, the light is red, I better keep pressing the brake right now. Yeah, I cannot move forward yet. So, all of that stuff needs to keep being processed inside of this artificial intelligence inside of a self-driving car. It needs to control the steering wheel based on what it sees and what it's experiencing. It needs to control the brakes, the accelerator, all the pieces of a car, the blinker, right? So that is essentially the job of a self-driving car. Did we ever think about that before? At that low of a level? Any comments about that? Any ideas? Do we think this is gonna happen soon? We're all gonna have self-driving cars? You think? Yeah, I see your point there, because maybe when you have self-driving cars, they can talk to each other wirelessly, like, here's my intention. You can't really signal your intention as a human driving a car <coughs> with anything other than, like, a blinker, right? Stuff like that. That's a great point. Any other comments about this stuff? This is maybe one day our future. One thing that I read about recently that's interesting to, to ponder is uh, in the future, it might not be a thing to need to own a car because they're, if they're self-driving, uh, you can just rent one for as long as you need it for a second. You have little car services. Maybe you don't need to own a car because you only need to like pick up a self-driving one, have it pick you up, take you where you need to go. And maybe there will be plenty of those. So maybe ownership of a car is going to soon be a thing of the past. It's probably going to be very expensive to own a self-driving car, too. So maybe that's helpful in that, uh, in that sense as well. Yes. Um, like, 
Very true. Like That's a great point. So maybe the question isn't even like, should we be building self-driving cars? Should we be building more like transportation, public transportation? That, yeah. Maybe self-driving cars only becomes important when we're trying to move long distances. Yeah, I like that. So yeah, these are fun discussions that we can have about all this stuff. Feel free to keep shouting out. Uh, I have plenty of things to talk about. Uh, if you don't, though. So here's a fun example. Um, here's how easy it is these days to to fool a self-driving car. So uh, some hackers were able to trick Tesla, uh, a Tesla car on its autopilot, into thinking that this sign, they just extended the three on the speed limit sign, just made it stick out a little bit more. It tricked the, the autopilot into thinking that it, the speed limit was 85 rather than 35. Oh, man. And if it's that easy, that's a huge issue, right? So hopefully that was fixed very quickly. But that's the kind of thing uh, that computers are looking out for. They're training themselves on probably the speed limit font. And if that's any different, that's one thing that can ruin the, the experience, right? So it's very easy to fool things right now. Needs more training, maybe. Maybe that's where we need to go. That's where we're headed. Okay? So that's self-driving cars. I just have a bunch of examples, as usual. Uh, let's go back to social media, since you have, uh, you're have writing essays about that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of people saying silly things on social media, I think we can agree. And like I said before, it's really not possible for a human to filter things, like to filter hate speech, stuff like that. So I, I assume that there's a ton of tweets a second, maybe a million even. Uh, I'm not sure though. But there's no way you can hire a finite number of people at Twitter to look at every single tweet as it's being posted. That's impossible. Okay, so the way that it, this is fixed, the way that uh, most bad things are filtered from social media like this, is to uh, use a different kind of machine learning, to use natural language processing, right? That's the fancy word we talked about. So use natural language processing to break down the sentences that are being tweeted and analyze the words that are in them. I'm assuming that you can very easily pick out a few words that should never be included in a tweet, for example, but you can get you can go further than that. You can do what's called sentiment analysis. That's a fun thing. Um, and this is an active area of research where you take your tweet, your Facebook post, and you programmatically, like artificial intelligence, it discovers what was going on. What was the sentiment? What was the tone of that piece of writing? Isn't that cool? So it can tell. You're able to train software to tell whether or not a post is saying happy things, sad things, super duper sad things angry things, super duper angry things, and hopefully hate speech as well. So that's kind of how we're filtering things these days. And that is essentially as good as we can do. We got to improve these, of course, because there's plenty of tweets passing through the cracks, but uh, it's definitely better than a human at this point because we have so much information. We have to give this problem off to a computer. Okay, so with that, Let's talk about kind of where we're headed, right? Computers are getting smart. Uh, maybe one day they're going to get really smart. Let's talk about when we can tell that they're like a human. So this is called the Turing test. Have we all heard of this before? It's an interesting little uh, thought experiment. I want to teach it to you if you haven't heard of it before. So here is uh, what the Turing test is, uh, of course, named after the famous Alan Turing. Uh, here is the game that you will play, and this will tell us whether or not like a computer has matched the ability of pretending to be a human. When a computer has thought well enough to uh, be mistaken for a human, for example. So here's how you play the Turing test game. So uh, let's say you are the, the subject of this experiment. So a researcher is going to come and take you to a room, 
and uh, they're going to give you a computer with some kind of chat software, something like Discord, okay? And so you're in a room all alone, your person C down here, and you're on your computer, and you got Discord open, and you're chatting away. You know, you've been told, that there is, uh, there's two people, or two things in the chat room that you're uh, able to talk to. There is one human, person B, who's talking to you on Discord, and there, then there is also a computer talking to you. Okay, that's the game. Uh, the computer, though, is pretending to be a human. That's the trick. That's how it's working. And so you are able to uh, just have a conversation. You're able to ask the other two participants. Again, you're not told. You're not sure who's the human and who's the computer. And they're going to reply to you uh, via text, of course, because text-to-speech is still not perfect and it still kind of sounds artificial. But uh, writing can be uh, pretty arbitrary, right? You can't really tell if a piece of writing was made by a human or a computer as easily as speech. So they're going to be talking to you via text. And at the end of the experiment, I don't know how long you get, maybe you get like five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, uh, you get to say, it's your turn to say, who you thought the computer was during that conversation. Isn't that cool? So that's the Turing test. And if you are unable to tell or if a bunch of people who are being tested uh, can't tell any better than random guessing, that means that the computer has passed the Turing test, we say, okay? And so it has successfully faked being a human. Isn't that cool? Do you think we can pass the Turing test these days? We kind of can, actually, uh, depending on the length of the test. Uh, believe it or not, computers are pretty good at fooling people. They can come up with responses and like follow a thread of a conversation. Not too badly these days, which is really exciting. Uh, for example, like there's plenty of chatbots I'm I'm sure you've seen on like uh, Discord channels, things like that that are able to respond to you, and some of them act like they're talking to you. Uh, and then there's also like automated chat on websites. If you go to like a website that wants to sell you something, you see all those little chat messages pop up like, "Oh, someone wants to talk to you. Do you want to? Do you have any questions?" That is usually a computer talking to you, taking your input and figuring out uh, a response to it based on your input. So it's, it's secretly passing the Turing test. There's not somebody awake at one in the morning ready to talk to you. Isn't that cool? So that's the Turing test. Uh, and that'll tell us whether or not a computer is like a human. Any questions about that? That's a fun little game. Yeah. So Alan Turing came up with the idea, so that was back in the 40s, I would assume. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know too much about how well computers have been doing over time. That's something I'd have to look up. That's a great question. That'll be fun to figure out. Maybe we should go to the Wikipedia page on the Turing test. Any other comments, questions? Because I want to show you how easy or how nice it is, uh, I guess how easy it is for a computer to come up with some stuff. Uh, let me show you something. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. So take a second and read this article right here on the right. Dun, dun, dun. Just take like a minute or two, skim it. This is an article. I won't tell you where I'm going with this, but just read it. Looks like a news article, right? And then we'll talk about why I'm having you read this. All right, hopefully that was enough time to read at least the first paragraph. Uh, and now, drumroll please, let me show you something. Uh, this article is completely fake, 
and it was written completely by a computer. No human input involved. They maybe gave them a starting line, but that was it. The computer filled in the rest, and it was a logical paragraph or a set of them, wasn't it? Like that, all those sentences followed from one another. That's how good a computer can make up stuff these days. Isn't that amazing? So, uh, yeah, let's talk about this. Whee! This was done by the fancy schmancy GP3, GPT-3 neural network. And so, again, it is pretending to be a brain. It's got some wiring of its fake neurons. And it's thinking things, and it's coming up with, on the output lines, words. Words to output, based on previous things that it has written, based on input that the user has given to drive the way that this text is being uh, generated. But yeah, all of this was made up by a computer based on a very short prompt. And that's all. It came up with the rest based on what it knew. It has been trained, this neural network was trained on ridiculous amounts of text-based information, like all of Wikipedia, all of like every news article ever written in the New York Times, things like that. They trained it on a huge amount of data and it can write and uh, follow its thoughts. Like it doesn't ever get off track, which is really cool. It has 175 billion virtual neurons com uh, controlling the way that it, it's outputting this text. And yeah, it's just you input a little prompt, it gives you back the answer which is very unfortunate because like, if you ever get access to this, that means you can write essays with it for this class and probably submit them for credit. But uh, hopefully uh, we're not there yet and it costs money to, to use this neural network. But I wanna show you a slightly less powerful version that's still really cool, okay? So, oh yeah, what's up? Oh, nice. Yes, that's the simpler version, and uh, that's always really cool. Yeah, it's fun to give those, like, every text message you've ever written, and so it comes up with something that you might say. It's always fun. But yeah, let me show you something more powerful than a Markov chain, but less powerful than this GPT-3 thing. If you could all please go to this website, it's uh, 6B dot, I don't know how you would pronounce this, Eleuther dot AI. 6b.eluther.ai. You don't have to write this down in like the written ice page or anything, but share among your group the kind of stuff that this comes up with, because it's fun. This is going to be the GPT-J6b, which is not as powerful, but still pretty cool. Uh, and you give it a sentence as a prompt, and then it starts writing stuff for you based on that prompt. And yeah, try, try out a few prompts and share them with each other. Let me... Uh, show you how. Technically, you honestly might be able to go to the top of this website. There might be a cooler one by now. Let's take a look. You can always come back. What do we got? What do we got? Anything? Anything? I'm not really sure how to... What is this? Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, never mind. We can find a better one some other time. But yeah, here are some, like, random things that you can change that I don't fully understand. Uh, but here is like a prompt. Like, I don't know. I love computer science so much. And so you give it something like that and you click run the model and it just starts writing based on that prompt. Oh man. Oh, okay. Well, maybe it doesn't work anymore. Okay, cool. I haven't tried this since last semester, but let's see. I'll save this as a prompt. Okay, run the model. Come on. Refresh. If this doesn't work, I'll, I'll try and find a place that you guys can do this, because this is really cool. Come on! Hmm. Oh. Like demo. I swear it used to exist. Okay, if you guys this is working, that's fine with me. I just was trying to show you something. Yeah. 
Yeah, now that I have the whole class trying. Well, if it, as long as it works for you guys, I'm happy. So yeah, take a couple minutes, try this out. Uh, I'll, click, I'll keep clicking this. Maybe it'll write something cool eventually, but I'll just change all these random things. Try over here. Where's a better one? I wonder if it's because I have an ad blocker. <laughs> A different prompt. Well, if anybody who gets it working found something cool and it wrote something cool, please share it. But I am sad. It looks like everybody's trying to write their essays with this today. Oh well. So sad. Where can I? Oh. Looks like it's just dead link after dead link, apparently. Thank you. Yeah, let's look at that. That'll be fun to look at. Just to show what you can do while well, that's loading. Text generation. Will this work? Try. Yeah, that's gonna make me make accounts on things. Never mind. What about you? Text generation API. What about this one? Oh, is this one going to work? Cool. I should save this for next time just in case. Insert text box. You can also try that one next time. But let's, let's read the, the real one first. Dun, dun, dun. All right, so are the first two lines in bold the things that you typed, Margaret? Yeah. Is it writing poetry? Cool. All right, so it starts forming some random story about somebody's dad. <laughs> Well, that's a sad ending, but that's super cool. You see how it's like taking what you started and then going somewhere with it. Oh man, let's let's not let's not think about it anymore. That's super cool. Uh, apparently, this one works. This website that I found, Text Generation API. 
I typed, I love computer science so much. It's like, I love all the skills I can learn, and I love learning from other people. So I've always had a deep love of this field of knowledge. I love working with great colleagues, learning from others, and being able to work with the people who do the most, really. So that didn't make enough sense, but that's okay. There are a couple big questions, and then it asks some questions. Like, it understands how a sentence can lead into future sentences and where it needs to go when it says something. That is where computers are these days, and the cool GPT-3 model is even better than these ones. Isn't that awesome? So yeah, any comments, questions about this stuff? Just wanted to give you an example of where we are. Yeah. Use it's fast. To develop, that's the hard part. You have to train it for a long, long, long time, like several supercomputers months worth of feeding in text, changing the weights in the neural network, stuff like that. But the second you have the neural network, it's just a bunch of matrix multiplications to compute an answer. Essentially, yeah. The, yeah, the training is the hard part. The use is not too bad. Yeah, so you need a supercomputer, essentially, if you want to do this on any reasonable time scale. That is the sad thing, but maybe that's not too bad. You need some, uh, you need to train it, and computers, maybe they're going to get faster and more affordable, but that's where we're going. So that's fun. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed that. Uh, the last thing in these slides that I want to talk about today is called the singularity. So just in case... Uh, you haven't heard of this very odd, maybe sad topic. Let me show it to you now. So let's talk about computers getting smart. So we talked about like chess and Go, those uh, like that artificial intelligence software was able to play against itself to get better. It was able to train against itself because it knew all the rules, right? And it got better each time. It did not need any extra human input. That's key. So uh, that means that the the AIs were thinking on their own, trying to become better AIs, superhuman, right? So the question about the singularity is, what if that same idea took place for just general intelligence, like this GPT-3 stuff? What if a computer could get so good that it could function like a human, and then it could talk to itself? Does that make sense? Then it could start talking to itself researching like with its little virtual collaborator and coming up with new ideas that humans could never think of. So what if we made a computer, the first computer that was smarter than a human? That's all we have to do, right? Just make one computer that has more general intelligence than a normal human would have. And then once you have it, you can copy that computer into a bunch, right? Now you have a bunch of humans, virtual humans that are smarter than any real life human. And then you have like an army, right? With better brains than any human could ever have. So then you can let that team of virtual people invent better versions of themselves. That's essentially what the singularity is. Yeah, that's what's going to happen, perhaps. <laughs> because the second they can invent better versions of themselves, uh, they'll keep getting smarter, right? Because they're going to think of things that humans could not think of because, by definition, they're already smarter than us. We just have to make the first computer smarter than us, and then this whole chain reaction occurs, right? And then we'll build that thing that this supercomputer was telling us to build because it's smarter than us and we trust it, hopefully. Um, and then that repeats forever and ever and ever until we have the smartest thing that hardware could make, right? We have super intelligence. We have computers making themselves better with no outside input from real life humans. And that is called the singularity. We just have to make the first computer smarter than a human and then it can improve itself. Isn't that cool? And hopefully it is like benevolent because uh, if it's not, it's going to kill us all probably. So that is the idea of the singularity. And here's like a, a fun quote about this whole idea. So the first ultra intelligent machine is the last invention that man ever need make, man need ever make, right? because then it can start doing its own thing, provided that the machine is docile enough to tell us how to keep it under control. So hopefully for its own good, uh, everything works out.
But yeah, maybe this is where we're going. We don't know if it's possible, impossible to make something at this kind of level, but uh, it's fun to think about if we could. Any questions, comments about this before I switch into something different? Oh, sure. Mm. Ah. I like that idea. But you can use two bits and you have four options. I don't see why you can't have ternary with binary. You can just disregard the fourth option, can't you? I would agree with that. Yeah, that's where the research takes place. Like, you have to have some, uh, some flash of genius. And maybe one day, a, a, like, a fake pool of neurons can have that flash of genius. That is fun to think about. Yeah, any other comments, questions about this stuff? Yeah. Uh, this is definitely not my field, so I would just be guessing, but I assume that it's processing power. I assume that, uh, yeah, you need just so powerful of a computer and you need so much training data that it's just not feasible at this point for us to have that amount of computational power. That's my guess, but it could... That's true. Yeah, maybe once we find it, we can start this chain reaction off, make a computer smarter and smarter. But isn't this fun to think about? It could be scary to think about, uh, depending on your point of view, but... These are fun ideas, I think. So uh, with that, I'd like to jump into something else, talking about, uh, this is more mathy, more logical, but it's still fun to think about. So let's go into this. It's called qualifiers and quantifiers. Let's first talk about qualifiers, because those are in our everyday speech. Uh, this is going to help us like make fancier logical statements to say exactly what we want about a program. So this is important stuff. So what is a qualifier? So let's, let's think about these ideas. So when we're arguing something, it's we're never really dealing in absolutes. It's like sometimes this is true, but in this other universe, this other thing could be true. It's, it's not always the case that this thing that you're trying to argue is always the best, right? There's always some kind of qualification along with the argument, usually. So let's try and answer this question. How can we soften our statements when we're making arguments so that they're not just a bunch of generalizations saying that this thing is always true, which is usually never the case, right? So let's uh, let's see how we can break down our arguments using qualifiers. So here's a nice quote that I think we would all mostly agree with. So almost every day is unbearably hot in Fresno when it's July. And somebody might retort, uh, hey man, no, there was that one day where it was in the 80s and it was wonderful. And this is where that word that I used at the start of the sentence comes into play. I said almost every day. Almost is a qualifier. Okay? So it's important to notice these inside of an argument. Maybe we haven't before. Because this makes the argument true, right? The word almost made it uh, correct. And this is not a proper counter argument because I used that word, isn't it? So here's a bunch of qualifiers. You can have, this thing is true about nothing, this thing is true about everything, and then you got stuff in between, right? So these are like your absolutes, and then you do not have to deal in absolutes, you can go within the spectrum here. So like, there exists some times where this thing is true. Uh, almost always this thing is true. Usually, generally, this idea is true. Almost never is this thing true. Sometimes it's true. That's kind of like right in the middle. And that helps us. Uh, be very precise with what we're trying to say. And that's, that's very important when you're writing an essay in this class, when you're trying to get something published in academia, all that stuff, right? 
And I'm sure if you thought long enough, you can think of some examples. Uh, one very relevant example I would say that I thought of uh, ahead of time is something like uh, using these terms to say stuff about like COVID vaccines, for example. So there was a lot of backlash about these and COVID vaccines, right? They're not 100% effective. Uh, how do you spell vaccine? vaccines? So you could say something like they are generally effective. And that would be a true statement. Right? So like maybe I can't, I don't want to make up numbers, but let's say it was close to like 80% of the time you getting the vaccine made it so that if you ever got COVID, it would be a much milder form of it, right? And a lot fewer deaths and things like that. So that, this number is not all, right? It's not the word all. It's also not the word none. It's, it's towards this end of the spectrum up the spectrum, right? This is like mostly effective, generally effective. It's not always the case that it works out. There's still uh, some examples, but like this is an argument for getting the vaccine, right? That's the idea. And so that is uh, my example of qualifiers. Definitely pick them out the next time you're reading an argument. Any questions about these ideas before I go to the logical version of this? Because we want to translate this into precise mathematics, uh, these kinds of ideas. That's our goal. How can we say that a computer program sometimes gives back the right answer? Things like that. And that leads us to the idea of quantifiers. Okay? And that's where I'm going. So quantifiers uh, are like the logical version of this. This is, uh, I should say, it's part of logic. And uh, so it's going to be stuff that gets jumbled around with our ands or ors and our nots and things like that. And it has, uh, I guess it's just more math, right? So this is math time now. Whee. So let's get on into this idea because our goal, or what I'm trying to tell us that our goal is, is we would like to translate qualified sentences that we might say in English, like this thing is generally true, into math so that you can prove without a shadow of a doubt that yes, that idea that was maybe vague in English is exactly what I wanted. Okay? And so there's a bunch of different quantifiers that could get us there. I'm going to teach you about two in this class. Okay? You'll learn more about them if you ever take CSI 26 or a more advanced uh, just math class in general. So these are called quantifiers, these two symbols, okay? Uh, we can actually formally specify, which is really cool, formally specify most of those qualifier words using these two quantifiers, plus the help of like our ands and ors and nots and things, those other logical connectors, those are the words. So uh, with the help of these guys, adding these gives us a lot of expressive power. And so, uh, this upside down A means for all, right? So it took an A and you just gave it a 180. So this means for all. Whenever you see this, A upside down, it means for all. And then they did the same thing with an E, capital E. They turned that 180. And uh, it is stands for there exists, okay? So if you ever see this, it means there exists something. And that thing is true. This is saying everything about this thing is true, okay? And I'll give you examples, uh, don't worry. But this is where we're going. And there are some other quantifiers. I want to say that right now. I'm not teaching you all of them. There are some other quantifiers that deal with time, like something should be true in the future, but it's not true now. That's really cool. Uh, so yeah, time in the future, maybe past even. But that is like graduate level logical stuff and not as important as what as these two. These two come up a lot, okay? So, yeah. Let's talk about them now. So here are some examples, and hopefully those will cause uh, these weird-looking symbols to make a lot of sense, okay? They, they do fill in for these English words that we already really understand, right? So for all, and there exists. Let's talk about them. So here, uh, let's first have an example of for all, okay? Let's talk about, uh, I want to represent the idea that uh, I have some variable x, and no matter the value of x, no matter what it could be, uh, its value is greater than 5. Okay, That's something that I would like to express in logic. 
Like I have some variable sitting in my program and what I would like to prove about it is that no matter what it holds, maybe it could hold many different values, no matter what, its value is greater than five. Okay, that's something that I'd like to be able to express. And so I can say, okay, for all x, x is greater than five. That's how you say it. No matter what x could be, it's greater than five. And that's how you'd write it, okay? So this is a, a logical sentence now that could be true or false. And I am asserting that it's true, which means that x must be like, x could be seven, that would work out, but x cannot be two, right? If I'm saying that this is true, x better not be two right now, okay? And saying that whatever value x could take on, it is greater than five. For every value of x you give me to solve this problem, it must have been greater than five. You see how I'm reading that? And that's a strong statement that we were able to prove previously or even write previously. I haven't told you how to prove this yet, but that's kind of nice. Okay, let's, again, back to the computer science examples. Let's say that, uh, let's have an example of there exists. So let's say uh, we want to express this idea. There exists a number n that is both prime and even, right? That's a true statement. How would I translate this into math? So there exists some number, call it n, there exists an n, and then use like a comma or something, or a dot usually. Uh, there exists an n, and here is what is true about the n. That's what comes after the comma. So there exists an n such that, that's usually the term that you use in math, the word such that, n is prime, and you could translate this to fancier math if you wanted to, but let's just keep it as English. So n is prime and n is even. Do you see how this would be the logical equivalent statement of this English text? There exists an n such that n is prime and n is even. And of course, this is a true statement because you could say, uh, you could show that n uh, can be two, right? n is allowed to be two, it's both prime and even, check. Cool, I found one good example. That's what exists does. There, uh, for all, kind of says something about every value, right? It, it could deal with infinity. But there exists, just needs one good answer and then it has been proven. Okay, any questions about these two examples before uh, we get a bit fancier? All right, let's keep on trucking then. So I would like, uh, let's see, do I want you to write this down? No, just as a group in your heads. I want you to just think about this, honestly. So I would like you to try to, in English, specify the idea of something being sorted, okay? So what does it mean for a list of numbers to be sorted? Say that this is my list in uh, Python. How would I explain to somebody, if they've never heard the word sorted before, how would I explain to them that this list is indeed sorted? What does it mean, right? So think about as a group, come up with a precise English definition only this time, precise English definition of what it means for something to be sorted, okay? So pretend you're talking to like an alien or somebody who has never heard the word sorted before. Uh, and then we're going to translate this into uh, our idea, our English idea, into precise mathematics. That means the list is sorted. So yeah, what does it mean? L is sorted. What in the world? So yeah, take a couple minutes as a group to, in English, come up with what it means for something to be sorted. Oops. Then we'll talk about our ideas.
All right, that's my timer. Did any group come up with a good idea that they're willing to share? Why is this list sorted? What's so special about it? How would you precisely explain this in English, that this list is sorted? Yeah. yeah. All these guys are smaller, all these guys are smaller than or equal to, all these guys are greater than or equal to. And that's a great point. Relative to who, though? Yeah, it could be anybody. You have to, this needs to hold, this idea needs to hold for everybody. Like everybody, depending on your point of view, pick any random element of this list, try them all. It better be the case that the people to the left of you are less than or equal to, and the people to the right of you are greater than or equal to. Nice. Yeah, that's a good idea. So uh, anybody else come up with something different than that? Or is that kind of the gist of it? Because, yeah, that is that is the great... Uh, uh, fancy version of what I would like to write. So uh, what does it mean that a list of numbers is sorted? So we need to somehow represent the idea that every element, like, or let's, let me show it to you this way. Like we have these elements here and this is what's true about them all, right? Eight is less than or equal to 27. 27 is less than or equal to 42, blah, 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 all that stuff. That is the goal. So it's not just getting strictly bigger. It's sometimes, like, it could stay the same. It could be like 8, 8, 27, 27. Like, it could stay the same for a little while, uh, as long as it's only ever changing for the bigger, right? And that's what it means to be sorted. So you can have, like, a stair step going on there. And so we want to express the idea that every element is getting bigger or staying the same. Staying the same. Uh, because, yeah, you could totally have this L prime list that was like one, two, 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 like as many twos as you want. Then a bunch of threes, four, five. That's still a sorted list, right? That's the idea. So, yeah, let's talk about this. Uh, and here is the goal. Here is how I can show you uh, that a list is sorted. Here is how I can express it in math. Let me show you. It's this one, and it's this fancy uh, expression, and let's try and talk about what it means. So let's use indices, actually, because that will help us say when a list is sorted, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Here are indices into this list, and so here is a mathematical statement. Maybe let me hide this English for, for, for a second. Here's a mathematical statement that works uh, and shows... Like, if this is true, that means the list L was sorted. Here's why. What it's trying to say is, for all I, where I is an index, try every index, for every single index of this list, it better be the case, if this index makes sense, that L of I is less than or equal to L of I plus 1. Isn't that interesting? And the idea is, yeah, you try every possible value of I, like I could be 2. At that point, it's saying, uh, okay, okay. That translates to when i is 2, you better check that l of 2 is less than or equal to l of 3. And yeah, cool, that checks out. You could try it for i equals 3. Right? you got to try it for every possible i for which this makes sense. l of 3 better be less than or equal to l of 4. Yeah. So does everybody see why this is saying try every possible index and make sure that the value at that index is less than or equal to the next thing. That's the first step. I don't really see how this is trying to assert that idea. And then, do you see how that means it was sorted? It's just picking out pairs of things in the list right next to each other. It's trying every pair of things one after the other and making sure that they go in order. The next thing is always bigger. Isn't that cool? So if you went back to English with this, it would be, this is the precise form of sortedness. For every index i that makes sense for L, because you might try some big ones and those don't exist, but for every index for which this idea makes sense to try, then we want to assert the, the fact that L's element at index i is less than or equal to L's element at index i plus 1. Interesting, interesting. 
Many questions about that idea. How this is a precise way of specifying that a list is sorted. All right, so if you're happy with this, this is the idea, uh, try using your quantifiers, your for alls and your there exists. I don't think this needs to be individual. I don't know what I was doing last time, but I don't think it needs to stay individually. With your group, try to create a statement with quantifiers this time that represents the idea that every non-empty list of numbers has a minimum number. Right? So there is no minimum in the empty list, but with the list with just one in it, not supposed to be a one, sorry. With the list with just one in it, the smallest element is of course just the one. Uh, and then if you have a bigger list, the three, like three, one, two or something, there is always a minimum somewhere in it. Yeah? So see if you can come up with a quantified statement that means this idea. Of course, this is not letting me switch. There we go. So you might have to use for all. You might have to use there exists. You might have to use a combination of them. But give it a try. This is a hard problem. Take a couple minutes to do your best and see if you can come up with a quantified statement that expresses the idea. Like if it's true, then it means that every non-empty list of numbers has a minimum which is something that we would like to be able to prove because it's a true statement, okay? Every non-empty list of numbers has a minimum. Okay, so give that, that, uh, give that thought a few minutes to swirl around in your head and then we'll come back and we'll do it together. But get a good head start. have to express non-emptiness, you don't have to express what it means to be a minimum, things like that. Maybe start with English. Okay. See what we did last uh, question.
All right. So, uh, first of all, let me show you something if you didn't notice it. Uh, this is an interesting word, and this is an interesting word. Uh huh. The word every, which, qual which quantifier does every belong to? Which one applies? Is it a for all or there exists? Yeah, it's definitely a for all, so we need one of those for sure. And then has. Has is also a quantifier. Which one? Yeah, it's saying that something exists, isn't it? There is a minimum. There exists a minimum for every non-empty list. See how those two quantifiers occur? That is important. So, with that in mind, let's talk about it. What does it mean that every non-empty list of numbers has a minimum? We need to somehow make sure that we don't allow the empty list to be involved in this statement, but for every other one, like the list with 1 in, the list with 3, 1, and 2, we need to somehow notice that there is always a minimum. Like, there's the minimum, there's the minimum, it's there, okay? So the first idea is we have to quantify over things. Every non-empty list, like, whenever you use a quantifier, you have to include a variable. That's what it does. It quantifies over something that can change. So for all i, that's the first rule. There's always a variable that gets introduced when you use a quantifier. Okay, there exists an n for every x, things like that. So that's the first statement that we need to notice. So we have to introduce a variable for an arbitrary list of numbers, right? Because we want to be able to talk about every list of numbers. When it's not empty, there's a minimum, right? That's our goal. So here's kind of how we'll do it in English. We'll say, for all lists L, that's where it's very explicit that we're using a for all. If L isn't empty, right, we need to somehow pick out the lists that we care about expressing this fact about. So we need to make sure that the Ls that we are talking about are not empty. Then there exists a minimum value in L. Do you see how that is making very explicit my use of quantifiers? Okay, and other logical statements as well. So, uh, also this. Do you see this if? Do you see this then? In logic, what does that correspond to? That is an implication, isn't it? If then. Something implies something else. We're going to use that too. And this is going to be our proof, our statement that we would like to prove. That's our goal. Okay? And so now we have like a statement mostly in logic. We need to talk about what it means to be a minimum now, okay? What in the world does that mean? So again, just like for sortedness, we have to say, like we need to describe the, the idea of having a minimum number among a bunch of other numbers using mathematics. So we need to like scratch our heads, think hard about what does it mean for a number to be a minimum? What, what are its properties? Because that's how we need to describe it, right, in math. What properties of a number make it minimum? Like, why is the 1 so special among all of these values in this list? And if you think about it long enough, like, a minimum means it's the smallest, right? Take everybody else, compare it to that, that minimum, it's always smaller, right? That's what it means to be a minimum. It's less than or equal to every other number in the list. And what do you know? I said the word every again. That's another for all. See how these keep coming up? So this is definitely a hard problem. I'm not going to ask you to do something as difficult as this on like the final or something, but this is where I want you to get uh, thinking about. Okay? You can understand this, I promise. So, yeah. So now we need to talk about how we'll express this idea. Like, it's less than or equal to every other number in the list. How do I get every other number in the list to talk about? We can go back to this pattern of talking about indices. So try every index, including the minimums index. Well, uh Compare, right? We need some variables to talk about the minimums index and the indices of all the other numbers, things like that. That is our goal, okay? So here, finally, drum roll please, let me show you the full quantified statement. It's going to look a bit weird and ugly, but it is correct, assuming I don't make any silly mistakes. So this is what we're trying to express, right? So that we can eventually prove it, if I teach you how to prove it. So for all lists L, right, for every list in the world L, if L isn't empty, then there exists a minimum in it. 
Okay, so for all lists L, if it's not empty, I express that a list in Python is not empty. We could talk about its length, right? You'd be like, call len, call len on L, and make sure that it's greater than zero. So if len of L is greater than zero, then something is true, right? It's my logical if-then statement with an implication. See how these are all coming together now? So if that's true then, if it's not empty then, there exists a minimum value in L, okay? So uh, I think the easiest way for me to talk about a minimum value is to talk about the index at which the minimum lives. So all of this is in parentheses. There exists a minimum index. I'll call it min underscore idx, okay? idx. There exists a minimum index. And what does it mean for it to be the minimum? At that index, it better be less than or equal to every other number in the list. So there exists a minimum index such that for every index in the list I call it, L at that min index is less than or equal to L at I. Did that make any sense at all? Hopefully with me talking it out at the same time, but that is the math. It's like all of this, if this is true, then all of this is true. That's what we would like to express. So for all lists L, if it's great, if that length is greater than zero, meaning it's not empty, then there exists a minimum index such that the rest of this is true. Oops. There exists a minimum index such that, there we go, such that for every other index, in, even including that one, because it's less than or equal to, the value at that index is less than or equal to the value at every other index, because we're trying them all with the for all. Okay? Is anything, can we express anything that is confusing about this? This might just be extra confusing, so we don't even understand why it's confusing to us, but does anybody like have a concrete reason why this might be confusing to them? I'll try, and try my best to explain it. And it might just be the case that we need a bunch of examples to let this sink in. Sometimes minimum index? No. Yeah, you want to read the backwards E as there exists. So there is somebody. There is at least one minimum index. Uh, because this is, in fact, a true case, because maybe the list was 3112. Both of these could be the minimum. I'm just saying there exists a minimum index, at least one. There could be multiple minimums in that list. That's a great point. Does that make slightly more sense? Okay. Yeah, and so back to English. It's like, for all this L, if L's length is greater than zero, then there is an index in L called it minimum index, such that for every index I in L, this is true. Even when, min when, even when I gets to be the same index, it's still less than or equal to itself, right? That's totally fine. So that is what it means to be a minimum. Yay. All right, and so I think that's as much as I want to... Uh, confuse you today. Are there any questions uh, before I move on? We're doing okay for now. Definitely study this. It's a very uh, in-depth, nice example to learn from. So, uh, in the last couple minutes, I want to introduce your next essay, okay? So we're week 12. No, I'm on the wrong class, that's why. So I'd like to introduce this essay to you. It is not a thousand words, so you're welcome for that. Oh, shoot. Uh, well, I need to sign in, apparently. And then I can click buttons. Okay, here we are. Uh, and here is the essay. Publish. Go for it. So this is going to be uh, kind of a whimsical essay. This is only 750 words, so not too bad. Uh, what I'd like you to do is talk about beauty in the digital space that we live in these days. So here's what I want you to do. Here's your prompt. Pick your favorite painting, okay? If you don't have one, go find one. Uh, and this painting needs to have been made sometime before 1900, let's say, okay? So 1899 is the youngest that this painting could be. Pick any school of painting. I don't care. Come up with your favorite one that's old, 
And then I want you to assume that the artist was alive today instead of back then, and they made that painting on a computer. Okay, so they made it in like Photoshop or whatever people are using these days. So they use like a drawing tablet like I'm using with my lectures. They use the fancy version of Photoshop. Uh, so they were using virtual brushes, but they're not like physical right now anymore. Okay, so think about that. Uh, my question, my prompt to you is, would that painting still seem as beautiful to you? Would you still appreciate it as much as you do? All right, so tell me why or why not analyze, explain your opinions. So you can go a lot of different places with this essay. It's a lot. It's pretty free form, but that's the general idea. 750 words about this prompt. Are there any questions about it? So I want you to cite at least one work in this essay, and here are some uh, interesting articles that might get your brain thinking. Feel free to cite those if you'd like. Uh, and yeah, if you don't really know too much about what digital art is, here are some people that I like to follow on Instagram. Like uh, this first artist has a bit of a like not realistic style, but it's still super cool. And then this second artist has a more realistic style. And so it looks like it might have been a real painting, things like that. So that's where you can uh, try and get an idea of what's going on. Oh, yeah, I would appreciate you tell me, telling me which painting you were, but I want you to cite, like, uh, an article, for real. Like, not don't cite the painting and assume you, you're off the hook. Oh, sure. Yeah, that would work. Uh, but, yeah, definitely tell me which painting you're using. You don't have to, like, cite the painting. I think that is a thing in some, like... Like MLA, I think you could cite a painting if you really wanted to, but I want you to cite an article. Okay? At least one article, please. Yeah. Any other questions about this? So that's my fun idea for us, and then we'll eventually get into, like, this topic in lecture, too. So it'll be a fun segue into that. So, yeah, if there are no more questions, that is all I have for you.